today I have James Lowry with, and James is the Senior Product Manager for Macy Nealon. James, welcome to my podcast today. Hey, good morning, Bill. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Hey, um, so folks watching this podcast, we're going to talk about a subject that's been a very hot topic, actually, and a very involved topic since the early 90s, and that's fugitive emissions. It's still a very big part, a big topic in our space, and James is going to uh, talk about the fugitive emissions and Mason the on. James, let's let's go there a bit. I know you got some slides to share, and let's just talk that through. Yeah, that's that's awesome, Bill. I really, again, appreciate you having us here this morning so that we can talk about the 30 plus years that we've really focused on within the Mason Ellen brand. So I'm going to go ahead and, and as you uh, advise, I'm going to share uh, a, a few slides here just to guide us through this little journey as we talk about this. So hopefully you can see my uh, my screen. And, I, I can, um, James, I can and I, I like the word journey. So that's cool. I like the way you phrase that. Emission awesome. management, looking right at it. Go. So, so from from an emission management standpoint, I think it's really important that we start to understand what it is that uh, your, the site may be doing. You'll see in the upper right hand corner where we're showing a drone, and this is an image that is is real life today. Where back 30 years ago, when we first started this, it was more uh, of a manual process, walking around with sniffers, et cetera, to see what type of equipment was leaking. But now you can actually take a drone and fly over and, and take an imagery to see what is taking place. And, and you've got four sources of emissions, Bill. You've got combustion, you've got flaring, you've got venting and fugitive. And the thing that we want to focus on during this little segment is really fugitive emissions, which by design, as an engineer, you're not expecting these things to leak. And, and that's the, uh, I think, the overall challenge as we go through this is when you you know combustion flaring and venting those are those are planned those are what the operators and the plant staff they know is taking place but fugitive you've got to plan to either reduce mitigate or control those and maybe we can help talk about that as we go through the discussion here cool. so um you know two categories of types of uh, gases we're looking at here is you've got greenhouse gases those are your carbon dioxide your methane etc but then you've got your volatile organic compounds, which are VOCs. Um, that's really what we're going to focus on. Again, we we could talk about you know your greenhouse gases, which those are the ones that are are focused on your your more the um, the ozone, et cetera. But yeah. VOCs are also what what contribute to bad air, and and that's what we want you know from an installed base, looking at your customers in your territory and looking at where our valves are primarily installed. That's where we want to kind of focus. And then you're looking at different packing types. So, you know, you've got PTFE or graphite. Those are really going to be depending on your temperature of your application. And then from a configuration standpoint, when we look at packing, you've got those valves with or without live loading. And we can briefly go into that on the next slide here. Um, and then if you, if you can't solve it with a graphite or PTFE packing, you may have to go all the way to bellows and mm -hmm. and bellows is is we know has been around for a very long time very good at its uh containing those uh, uh particular emissions but hopefully we can solve that and meet you a demand with uh, some type of ptfe or graphite packing before i go to the next slide bill take a look at that voc on the right hand side this is a little bit older uh, data from mm -hmm. 1995 but you see they put valves at 62% of the total emissions. And that's really why our industry is talking about valves so much lately. I really think, you know, you, you said early 90s you were seeing this, and I can tell you from Mason Hill, and we've had experts looking at uh, fugitive emissions packing solutions ever since uh, the 92, I think, is where we first started coming out with our emission-free seals. But we've really in heightened our awareness as we've come into more of the last 12 to 15 years and it's it's from data like this that really you know bring it to our forefront so you know i i expect some of our users you know we may have some that are really knowledgeable around valves we may have some uh, listeners this morning that uh, may not know as much so let's just talk very briefly about two types of valves and where they can leak so you, on the left-hand side, we have reciprocating valves. 
Bill, those are, as you and I know, that's how we define them here in Mason Ellen, but those are your sliding stem. Your, yeah. your stem is moving up and down, up and yeah. down. So it's, it's a constant dynamic movement. And so you really get a lot of wear from that stem seal packing box interface where I have a number one uh, identified. The other source that could potentially be a fugitive emissions would be any pipe flange gasket joint. So we're showing a flange valve here. Now you can get a socket weld in, you can get a butt weld in on those valves. But again, in, in a lot of the process facilities that we're talking about right now, you could have flange joints. And then of course, the third that, that people don't always, you know, associate with, with reciprocating valves is your body tabonic gasket joint. That's a really big one. And you, you've got to realize, you know, hey, look, I, I do have a joint here. The, the media of the pipe can escape here. And so I need to monitor that. And then on the right hand side, we're showing a rotary valve. And, and, and the biggest thing about the rotary valve is you still have your stem seal box interface and you still have your pipe joint, but you'll notice over there, Bill, we don't have a number three, okay? What we, most of these constructions from a rotary standpoint, you get the chance to eliminate that body to bonnet gasket. And, you know, there's other factors that you need to, to bring in and attributes based on your application, but this is a really good, if you're focused on from an emission management standpoint at your site, this is a really good solution because you're eliminating one of those sources immediately when it comes to the valve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so sure. that makes sense. Yeah. You, you know, the other thing is we talk about, again, let's, let's stay focused on the emission management concept. Mm -hmm. When a site is looking at their emission management, they need to develop a strategy. And, and if we look at this particular summary of uh, industry standards, let's call it, what we've tried to do here is summarize it and there's really five categories that we can talk to here um the first one is what standard is your is your site going to monitor to you know i show iso at the top here followed by the ANSI fci and then we've got the api vdi is a very uh, um, uh reference code that's been out there many years um you don't see it as predominant in our our specs today the two that you see predominantly are the ISO 15848 or the API. And I wanted to go ahead and show everything on here because back in 92, as I referenced earlier, we were doing all of our stuff to FCI 91-1. And you'll know that the application as we look at, you know, number two, it's control valves. We've switched from that FCI 91-1 to more of the ISO 15848 because it's the only standard that we have out there that is both control and on off valves. And that's really important, Bill, as, as you and I are out there speaking with our users and customers, we want the Mason Ellen product to be representative of how it's gonna be used. And, and that's really important because a control valve, Mason Ellen valves are, are primarily the control valve solution out there. And we don't wanna be testing it to just an on off service. Our valves are operating from a you know dynamic standpoint. They could be operating at 30% one hour, and then the user needs to increase it to control their process up to 80% the next hour. They're, and they're cycling. They're cycling. Yep. They, they are. And yeah. and then so so cycling. Let's move over to item number three, and you can see all of these different cycles from these different codes. The API codes are only around 1,500 cycles max where that ISO standard that I'm mentioning, we're trying to test our valves up to 100,000 cycles at that CC3 level. And it's not just a mechanical cycle, we're also looking at thermal cycles. So we're putting these valves as we test them in our facility, Bill, we're putting them through a, a temperature cycle and then cooling the valve back down and raising the temperature back up. And we aim to do four cycles during that. And, and that, those four cycles are, or throughout that 100,000 cycle from a mechanical side. Um, and, and, and this is our best opportunity to put it through that real life environment that our customers are experiencing. Um, the, the fourth category isn't as important. Um, you'll see a lot of specs out there referencing methane. Um, the, the thing about the ISO standard is it's testing both helium and methane. And you may say, hey, why are we doing that, James? Well. There's no um, there's there's no link today, Bill, in our industry that says 
methane is better than helium or helium is better than methane, or if you test one, you can validate the other. Um, I think from a sound engineering practice, we all know that helium is a smaller molecule. So yeah. you would think that that would be the most stringent test. But we, you know, since we don't have that validation or um, uh, acceptance from the standard, we usually do both of those tests. And then you can see from the far right, the different leakage rates are all over the place. You know, you've got uh, you've got the the ISO standard is you can get down to what we call class A from a methane standpoint, which is less than 50 parts per million. Bill, when you think about it, a lot of these standards out here, you look at that API stand, uh, 622 standard, its leakage rate is 500 parts per million. Well, yeah. that's the standard EPA requirement today, but then you'll see API 624 is referencing 100 parts per million because we have seen that the EPA, when they put on a, a particular site under um, a consent decree, boom, you, all, you now have to worry about 100 parts per million. So, so we've really tried to focus on on the full spectrum here, um, and and hopefully, you know, any user we we can they could follow up with us and contact us, and uh, we have this chart available on our website, Bill, um, for for anyone to go download, as well as this particular little case study here that that we could talk about if you want. Yeah, let's go into that. Um, uh, let's let's drive to some of uh, Mason's solutions here. Go ahead. Yeah, so so th this case study is really, you know, it's it's an opportunity to share with the user that, hey, we know that the challenge is out there to control these uh, the fugitive emissions that we've been speaking about, and and we've done our testing, we've benchmarked benchmarked it against other industry valves, et cetera, and we know that we can help reduce that. Um, if you remember me speaking earlier, we either want to reduce, we want to mitigate, or we want to control. And in, in most cases, Bill, what we've identified here is that with our low E packing, it is ISO 15848 uh, certified as CLLT, that's certified low leak technology. And, and that is going to help that customer have that peace of mind that when they're using this, they're going to be well below any of those EPA limits out there. Most of our valves are uh, our, our Camflex valve, for instance, it's a rotary product line and and it's eliminating that bonnet to body seal. And we've been able to test it through those uh, rigorous standards that I just shared. And it's as low as one part per million of one part. OK, and, and that's huge. And, and what's nice about it is any of our customers could could relate this directly to their bottom line. They could see a plan efficiency. They're not having to send crews out there to to monitor those valves as much. And um, any of this stuff can be retrofitable in the field. We could we could send them a new valve with the technology built into it. Or if you've got clients out there that want to upgrade to the low E technology, we have retro kit uh, available. Uh, they could contact you, Bill, supply them the serial number, and we could make sure that we get that kit to them uh, in, in a timely fashion. Absolutely. And actually, I have firsthand knowledge of that because I have quite a few of my customers and my customer base upgrading from standard packing to LE packing. Absolutely. That's great. That's so, great. So I, I've, I've lived that and I've walked that, walked that walk and talked that talk, James, many times. So, hey, um, thank you so much for joining me today. Great presentation, great delivery on the fugitive emission subject. It's a topic that's uh, still a very prevalent topic in our territory. Uh, folks, uh, again, hats off and thanks again, James Lowry, for joining me from, um, from uh, the Senior Product Manager for Mason Neal. James, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And folks, uh, you want some solutions on fugitive emissions? Have a conversation, please give us a call at Easter Controls. Thanks again.